Hello and welcome to our next episode of At the Table with Jennifer McQueen. We, of course, are here with my favorite person to talk to about all things California legislation, uh, founder of Legislation Take Action and Homeschool Concierge, Wendy Eklund. Hello, Wendy. How are you today? Hi, Jennifer. Hi, everybody. I'm good. Thank you. I am so glad to talk to you. It's been a little while. We've kind of been on like a little bit of a hiatus, I guess, but we are back in action because of course, everybody wants to know an update. Now that Governor Newsom has signed AB 130 um, yeah. and you last night actually attended a webinar hosted by YMNC. Um, so what can you tell us about any new info, what you heard, what you know, and really what should we know? Um, okay, so I was very thankful to be able to attend that webinar. YMNC is a charter school law firm that serves more than half of our charter schools here in California. So I figured what better place to gather information on how our charter schools and their legal teams are going to be um, determining what this law means for their programs. So um, a couple of things that are key is that AB 130 is the bill that actually got passed and signed by the governor. Um, all charter schools who were up for renewal between January 1st, 2022 and June 30th, 2025 will automatically have their charter term extended by two years. So that actually helps our charter schools if they were up for renewal. It's a big process to go and get that renewal. So this helps them have you know, probably two more years to be able to get all of that paperwork together and work with their authorizers. So that was good news. Um, I feel like this is bad news. Um, it's not horrible news, but the moratorium that was brought about with AB 1505 was set to run in from AB 1505 from January 1st, 2020 to January 1st, 2022. In AB 130, they extended that moratorium to January 1st, 2025. So we can't have any new non-classroom-based charter schools pop up. Um, and then there was the requirement of the independent study changes that we were all so worried about. And so one thing that I found interesting is that that requirement for the independent study, all county offices of ed and all school districts have to offer independent study, but brick and mortar charter schools are not required in AB 130 to offer an independent study program. Now our schools, non-classroom based charters are already independent study, so they have to abide by these new requirements. Um, some of these new requirements are there has to be a plan that if a student wishes to return to in-person instruction, how that's going to happen. And there's a lot of question about that because our schools don't have in-person instruction. So there was talk at the, um, at the meeting that possibly our schools are going to have a list of schools in the area that can take the student for in-person instruction if they want to withdraw from the non-classroom base and go and attend a classroom base, which I think is a great solution instead of our schools having to scramble to design an in-person class when most of them don't even have locations. So hopefully that's what we'll see happen. Um, the next couple of things are they have to track level um, the satisfactory educational progress that is made. They have to um, make sure the students are expanding in their grade level standards. And so that's all stuff our schools are already doing. It needs to be documented and um, tracked and mentioned in the master agreement. There's the tiered re-engagement strategies. Um, and then the strange, the other strange part was kind of what we felt like was making independent study not independent by requiring opportunities for synchronous instruction and um, that was daily for TK through third grade, weekly for fourth through 12th, and um, live in, blah, 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 blah go back. <laughs> Sorry. I'm no, sorry. you're fine. I you're fine. It's a lot of info. It's a lot of info. You're okay. fine. So, so, for, so can I start over? Okay, so the synchronous instruction requirements are TK through three opportunities must occur daily. For fourth through eighth, opportunities must occur weekly along with daily live interaction. And for ninth through twelfth, opportunities must occur weekly. These can be classroom style, they can be one-on-one, -on -one, they can be um, in person, they can be over 
um, something that has offers two-way interaction. The good part about this is that it says that it's opportunity. So the school has to offer it and the school has to track whether or not your student partakes, but you do not have to partake if you do not want to. So those were kind of the key takeaways. Um, the other thing that we should be aware of is if you've already signed your master agreement from last year, you're going to have to, like if you signed it for last year for this year, because sometimes some schools have you sign it in the spring or right towards the end of the year for the following school year, we're all going to be required to sign the new master agreement once they're approved by the boards. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. We're hoping that it's not going to be too horrific and that we can all just say no thank you to those classes that we don't want. And if you do want them, that's great. Now you'll have a new offering for your, your students. Yes, so theoret theoretically more offerings and more opportunities for those that want them. But here's my question for you now. So it seems though like it is not necessarily going to restrict the freedom that we're used to in homeschooling because our learners will not have to uh, take advantage of these opportunities, these in-person opportunities, if they do not want to. Um, but I'm wondering, in your opinion, could forcing the charters to offer these opportunities potentially have any sort of long-term domino effect um, on the learners or on the schools themselves? I'm not sure I'm following what you mean. You mean well, like... Yeah, I'm wondering if how this could affect the charter schools themselves having to adjust and offer these new opportunities and could that in any way then affect um, the families who are enrolled? Well, I think it's going to depend on how the teachers take to this. Are they going to have time to do this sudden influx of in-person instruction. It's not something they're used to. A lot of our teachers are homeschool parents themselves and they're homeschooling their own children. How are they going to feel about this? A lot of our teachers also are already offering to do field trips and do um, they do little science classes online with kids during the pandemic. So I think that just depends on how our teachers react and then how that's going to impact the schools if their teachers are upset with them or if the teachers just jump right in and are happy to do it. I talked to a lot of teachers who actually missed the classroom part of it, but they loved being able to have the flexibility to homeschool their own children. So I don't think that I can, I think that's going to be a reaction that each individual person's going to have. So I don't see, I don't see me being able to make um, a guess on that one. So it'll just be interesting to see how each individual school and learner could possibly be affected. Okay. Right. Well, and that's okay. part of the interesting thing about it is that it can't even be just a teacher from the school. It has to be your teacher of record. So okay. your teacher of record, like you, for instance, have children of three very different ages. And so that teacher has to be able to teach these lessons to all three of your children's ages and probably not at the same time or maybe at the same time. So what is that going to look like? We don't know yet. Okay. And then my last question on this, and it's an easy one. I'm just wondering, so is there any possible scenario in which non-classroom based charters could make it a requirement for learners to take advantage of these in-person opportunities? I don't see them making it a requirement because they know that they serve homeschool families who thrive through their independence of educating their children on their own as the as the main instructor. So I don't I don't see them making it a requirement because you can't go and make something a requirement that you know your the market that you serve isn't going to want to be a part of. Okay, very good. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, it sounds like this is going to go in effect. It'll be it sounded like it was maybe a wave of over the next few years. Is that correct? Oh, no. All of this has to be ready to go for the next school year. That's why I'm saying oh, wow. you're going to have to sign master agreements. It's like a mad rush to get all of this documentation done, all of this planning done, and it all has to be done for the start of the school year. Okay. So it is going to uh, take place 
pretty immediately. So everybody get ready. Right. <laughs> okay, right. good. Um, my, I, I do want to clarify though, because I do think that sometimes there is still a little bit of confusion with the independent study and the non-classroom based, because I'm still seeing a lot of questions um, when people hear independent study. And the first question is, well, if I'm non-classroom based, is that me? Is that not me? Is it some people? So just if you could just real quick tell us, is that us? Is that not us? How does that play out? Yes. So non-classroom based charter schools are classified as independent study programs. So if you're homeschooling through a charter school, you are an independent study student enrolled in a non-classroom based charter school. If you sign a master agreement, you're in an independent study program. So even your independent study programs at your districts and your county offices of ed require the signing of a master agreement. So yes, unfortunately, this does apply to us, but we're hoping that it's not going to be that bad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fingers crossed, right? right, right. <laughs> All right. So let's talk a little bit now about our governor race. So we have somebody in particular who has thrown his hat in the ring. Uh, we have Kevin Kiley, um, who is running for governor of California. So talk to us a little bit about what this could mean possibly for our homeschool community. Could this be a positive thing? Could this be a bit of a win uh, for us homeschoolers if uh, Kylie were to win? Well, I personally think it would be a win because if you guys spend any time watching the assembly or the assembly education committee, when these kinds of bills are making their way through the assembly, Kevin Kylie is always speaking out in defense of our students, in defense of what we do, and in defense of school choice in California. So I feel like it would at least be a win for California with our school choice because he definitely supports school choice and our students. And he's always been there for us ever since being elected. Yes, I would agree. You know, for me personally, um, Kylie came onto my radar at that uh, California Education Committee hearing yes. uh, when AB 1316 was um introduced and talked about, you know, he really was somebody who is clearly in favor of charter schools, our alternate education. Um, he seems very open to um, freedom of school choice. Yeah. So when we are speaking specifically about the homeschool world and, um, you know, school choice, uh, I would agree that Kylie is has always um, been an advocate and seems to really champion for that freedom. Well, I get the question a lot, like, well, what can we do to stop these? We have to vote people out. And, and then I hear people say, well, I'm never going to vote Republican or I, you know, I'm not going to change the way I vote. And I totally get that. But honestly, we don't need to have it swayed all to be Republicans. What we really need is just a split in power. And if we have a split in power, even if all we can accomplish right now is between the governor and the supermajority they have at the Capitol, that could be helpful, right? <laughs> So. Yes. And, you know, on that, um, talk to us maybe a little bit on your thoughts about that big picture and what are some things that maybe people could step up and really start doing to try and make some change? Well, I think we all should run for local offices ourselves to get the word out about, you know, what we do, why we do it, why school choice is important. So I want to um, hold an event. I've been working on putting it together hold an event to teach us parents how to run for local offices and then work up our skills to maybe run for assembly or a state senate, which would be awesome if we could get some people that really understand what we want there. And then the other thing is for us to work as a community um, before the next elections to maybe kind of figure out which people we would like voted out of office. Maybe it's a certain area we want voted out of office, like oh, Long Beach. Um, we might want a new assembly member in Long Beach. <laughs> You know, quite possibly, I could really get behind that one. <laughs> right? So I think that's what we have to do. And just honestly, just split the power. We don't need any one party having full power in either side of the Capitol. I would agree. You know, I if I'm being quite candid, I am completely fed up and tired, infuriated, yeah. and... Um, well, it just pisses me off whenever I see such a clear cut 
party lines vote right. and, and these people they don't even know their left hand from their right hand and what they're voting on right. they are just following the crowd um, and following their party right. and we could just get some people who have the well who have the balls to think for themselves and right. vote for themselves and actually care about the constituents and you know really what the people want um, I, I do think we could see a lot of positive change. <laughs> yeah, the thing that bothers me the most is when they ask the right questions. The things that we've armed them to ask by making our calls and sending our letters, they ask those questions in the committee hearing and they ask those questions on the floor and then in the very next breath they say, but I'm gonna support this bill. And you're like, no! Yeah, yes, that is, yes, that, that is exactly what I'm talking about. We have to find people who are willing to break free from that. Right. Um, it is uh, it is very tiring to watch yeah. it happen time and time again. Okay, so this is actually a perfect segue into Legislation Take Action and Homeschool Concierge. So a lot of people know you from Legislation Take Action, the Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter, um, keeping us all updated on the California edu education uh, legislation, the new laws, uh, what we should be aware of. But something that I think um, we really don't talk about that we should is the other portion of what you do, which you are also the founder of Homeschool Concierge. Um, now I know with that you offer lots of resources, um, services. I know for me, what drew me to it um, was how eclectic the resources and um, the webinars are that you do and um, truly what a wide audience you can reach. So maybe you can talk to us a little bit about what Homeschool Concierge is and what you offer. So Homeschool Concierge is really just a nonprofit set up to serve our community and whatever I hear that we need. Um, so we've done everything from, um, we have like an ambassador program where we bring on parents who are interested in running field trips or teaching classes and we help make that happen. We have taken over um, learning centers and um, helped them continue to run if someone had to step away from a learning center or leave a learning center that they owned in the past. We have helped charter schools actually like get started and founded. We've done um, purchasing. We have a purchasing. We have um, access to purchasing software, and then we've hired the staff to help the school do the purchasing while they were very small, and then they took that staff over to their school, and now they do that themselves. Um, we offer consulting if you need help homeschooling or maybe homeschooling is not for you and you just want to learn more about school choice, you can make an appointment with me and I can help you with homeschooling things or school choice things. Um, we're hoping to get back to our field trip program because we all miss our field trips and the world is opening up again. So we have that. And then we're looking to start community centers. I have two storage facilities full of homeschooling curriculum that I've been trying to get into a location since before COVID hit, didn't find the right locations Then COVID hit. And it's been like, well, now I'm paying for storage. And I have all this cool stuff that people could use, but they can't get to it. So um, I'm working on that as well. So there's a number of things that we do. And if you think of something that needs to be done, well, you all have my cell phone number. So just call me or text me. <laughs> Okay, wonderful. And also, you know, I want to add some of the webinars that you have done in the past, I think give a pretty good taste of what people can expect. Like I know you have had guests um, speak about uh, university opportunities for oh, yeah. schools, um, talk about various curriculums, talk about various um, programs, you know, so maybe you can well, list a few. I'm not thinking of all so of them. Those are um, actually can be found on our webinars tab. And we've done some really amazing ones. Last year, we ran the homeschool experts panel during the summer. And we had um, all of the homeschool associations on one that was super interesting. We had just expert homeschool parents helping to guide, um, you know, new homeschoolers. And then this year, we've been running the one on one series with different businesses we've had. Um, we've even had Kathy Duffy, um, who runs Kathy Duffy's Reviews. We had Rainbow Resource. We had Elle Marie from Learn Beyond the Book. We had Rachel from um, Wild Math and Wild Reading, which is now Wild Learning. So we've had some really great um, guests and 
actually people have been so tied up in the legislation that they haven't really been watching our webinars. So if you have time, go check them out on the webinars page. They're all up there and you can watch the recording. So there's some great information up there. Okay, great. And now my last question is, so what kind of cost can people expect? Are there costs involved? Um, are there free services? What can they expect? So there, the webinars are totally free and you can access them right from the website. If we get a, um, our community center, there'll be a cost associated to being a member of that because we need to be able to pay the rent and pay for the insurance and all those things. Um, the consulting also has a cost associated to it. If it's something you can't afford, please call me. I'm, I don't, I'm not going to turn you away because you can't afford it, but you need help. I hope that I have made that very clear by posting my phone number all over Facebook that people know that I'm here for them. So, um, yeah, but there is a cost to that. And then if we have learning center classes, then there's a cost associated with that. And then any services we run for charter schools, we work out a contract with them to run those services. So some things have costs and some things don't. And honestly, we are always available that if you need help, we will negotiate and work with you for what you can't afford to pay. So don't be afraid to ask. Yes. I think one of the most beautiful things that I have come to find about you is at the heart of it all, you really truly do just want to do it to help people and be of assistance. So it's a very selfless act. Uh, like I said, it's one of my favorite things I've found out about you uh, since getting to know you better. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> oh, of course. So now tell everybody, of course, they need to know how to contact you, how to stay up to date and you know, how to know about all the webinars coming up. Um, so if you want to direct them to your contact info, Okay, so our website is just homeschoolconcierge.com. And then, of course, so we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Legislation Take Action. Now, Legislation Take Action, typically I just let it go dormant when there's nothing that we need to fight. So I don't keep putting things in the news feed to, like, overwhelm you. I like it to be like, oh, my gosh, now there's something and I want to be able to draw your attention. So I don't like you to, like, tune me out because there's nothing going on and I'm just trying to fill space. So if it's dormant for a while, just know that we don't have anything to worry about right now. And then Homeschool Concierge, we also have a free newsletter and that goes up on there um, periodically when we make those. So check out homeschoolconcierge.com and then on social media, both Legislation Take Action and Homeschool Concierge. Okay, wonderful. And I noticed that I have on there at Legislation Take Action, but it is, you can find Wendy at both for Le yeah. Legislation Take Action and Homeschool Concierge at both places. Okay, yeah. perfect. So thank you, thank you, Wendy, so much for joining me today. Like I said before, you are one of my favorite people to talk to about all things California uh, legislation. So if you would like to stay up to date, again, follow Wendy, keep in touch, um, check out the website. Also, make sure you just subscribe to this YouTube channel at The Table with Jennifer McQueen. We are always trying to get Wendy on here uh, to talk to us and give us updates. Um, also, though, coming up, very exciting, on Friday of this week, we will be posting our homeschool curriculum review. Uh, I will also be doing a homeschooling for free um, in the next two weeks, which will feature windy again. Uh, so we'll give you all kinds of tips and info on how to homeschool for free. Um, and then of course, speckled in there, we're always having a uh, special guest interviews like this one with Wendy and um, an especially great one that I am working on that I hope to feature soon. I will be interviewing um, some students coming live mm -hmm. to us from Nigeria and South Sudan. Uh, oh, they are awesome. in the process. Yes, they are in the process of trying to really just make their community a better place. They're focusing on the UN sustainable development goals and bringing education and opportunity back to their community. So we will have an interview with them and find out all about them and their life. Uh, thank you so much again, everybody, for joining me and listening in. Thank you, Wendy. Of course. Thanks for having me and have a great week, everybody. Thank you so much.